Inside Nick's office, we find a case file lying on one of the desks. Inside the file is Marty Bullfinch's holotape. The Marty Bullfinch case. Marty was Nick's partner. Emphasis on the was. He must have been some kind of desperate to come to us for help after all this time. Well, Marty and I never exactly saw eye to eye. Mostly because he was usually passed out on the barroom floor. Aw, come on, Nick. Think of the good times. What, when he quit? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's the one I'm thinking of. Nicky, you old bucket of bolts, it's Marty. I know it's been a while, but I came across a little mystery I thought might get your circuits firing. You remember that ugly grasshopper statue on top of Faneuil Hall? Turns out it's got a note in it. A note written by the son of one, Shem Drown. I don't expect that name means anything to you, but the guy was a coppersmith. Way back when folks did shit like that. Apparently, this note leads straight to the old guy's stash. I don't know what's in it, but I'd sure like to know if it's still there. I'm gonna go do a little recon on the hall. Decide you want to get the team back together, you let me know. Sounds like Marty and Nick were one time companions and treasure hunters, but for some reason, Nick and Marty either fell out or didn't see eye to eye on something. It looks like Marty went in search of the Gilded Grasshopper by himself. But now that Nick has you, the two of you can race after Marty to see if you can find him and the Gilded Grasshopper. The adventure takes you to the doorstep of Faneuil Hall. Faneuil Hall. Cradle of Liberty turned Slaughterhouse. One of the many stops along the Freedom Trail. The hall is infested with super mutants and their hounds. They will attack on sight, but you also may find them in combat with other nearby hostels. Most notably, a mythic death claw on the roofs of one of the nearby buildings. One of the super mutants with a missile launcher may take shots at the death claw, but in my experience, he never had much luck. Super mutants patrol the outside of Faneuil Hall on all sides. The hall itself is surrounded by two towering skyscrapers, so we need to go through the alleyways and clear out all of the super mutants to reach the front and the back. On the southern side of the building, we find scaffolding that goes halfway up the building. Here we can clear out super mutants, including the one that had the missile launcher, taking pot shots at the mythic Deathclaw. Once dead, we can go back out front. Here we find a pile of wooden chairs on fire around a statue. This statue was the statue of Samuel Adams. The plaque on the statue gives us a brief history of real-world Faneuil Hall. The hall was built by a wealthy merchant named Peter Faneuil between 1740 and 1742. After completion, Faneuil donated the building to the city of Boston. It burned down in 1761, leaving only the brick walls, but was rebuilt by the town in 1762. The hall is and always was a public marketplace. The people of Boston in the 18th century were proud to have this hall as a center of American commerce. Merchants who worked out of this hall were the first to stage protests against the British Sugar and Stamp Acts, which eventually led to the idea of no taxation without representation. The place was also used as a meeting hall where Bostonians first fielded arguments against British occupation and for American independence. The town hall style discussions that went on here helped produce the unique American colonial concept of freedom from British oppression that eventually culminated in the Boston Tea Party. Many of America's founding fathers met here to discuss ideas of revolution, including Samuel Adams, whose figure is depicted in the statue just out front. The collection of so many founding fathers arguing in one place led to Faneuil Hall being nicknamed the Cradle of Liberty. This this nickname was then used by one of the very first Republican black legislators in Boston named Julius Chappelle. In 1890, he gave a speech here called At the Cradle of Liberty, where he argued to give blacks the vote. And it was also here at Faneuil Hall that President Kennedy first announced his candidacy 
for President of the United States. Peter Faneuil wanted a grasshopper weather vane on the top of Faneuil Hall to complement the one that was on top of the Royal Exchange in the City of London. This was part of Peter Faneuil's idea of making Faneuil Hall and Boston the capital of finance in the New World. He went to local coppersmith Shem Drown to create this unique gilded grasshopper, which is the very relic we have come here to find. Entering the hall from this front entrance, we see two Protectrons on either side, one sitting outside its charging dock and another still in the charging dock. We can hack these to turn them into temporary companions and use the nearby wall-mounted terminal to release them. Heading down the steps, we immediately get attacked by a bunch of super mutants and their hounds. There are four or five super mutants around here, making it difficult for a stealth character to sneak through. But if you're a commando like my character in this shot, you just run in guns blazing. This ground floor was the marketplace. Like in real life, the Faneuil Hall in the Fallout world was a center of Boston commerce. There are four different shops here. One is a bakery, but I'm having a hard time reading this sign. Pirellet? Piretes? Pirello? I can't make this out. Maybe one of you can let me know what the sign says in the comments below. I do make out the word bakery, and we see some bakery sweets still in the display containers. Next, of course, is Fallon's Department Store. Fallon's has a big presence in Fallout's Boston. I did an entire video on the Fallon's Department Store and the Fallon's Company, which, if you're interested, you can watch here. Next to Fallon's is Walden Drugs. Looks like they cooked up their own drugs. We find a chemistry station here and a small assortment of chems in the shelf behind the counter. And lastly, there's a deli Mart, with nothing terribly interesting behind the counter. In the corner, we find an elevator that brings us up, but let's skip this for now. We want to take the stairs to kill as many super mutants as we can. In a room next to the elevator, we find the manager's terminal, which is not only another way to release the Protectrons in their charging station, but it tells us a little bit of lore about how Faneuil Hall was used in the Fallout universe. The first note, Marketplace Reports tells us how the marketplace was faring financially. In the first week of August, sales were down 3% compared to the previous year, and the managers think that this has to do with shoplifting. The merchants in this stall argue that there should be protectrons here to discourage people from shoplifting from the marketplace. However, the Cultural Preservation Society that met here argued against it. They didn't want the protectrons to ruin the cultural significance of Faneuil Hall. The next week, they had an 11% bump in sales due to the Columbus Day holiday, and yet they still lost money, with 12 confirmed shoplifting incidents that week alone. The merchants in this marketplace threatened to sue Faneuil Hall for not protecting their shops. The manager considers moving forward with the Protectron idea despite the society's objections. But in the final week, we see that sales in Faneuil Hall are down 81% due to press coverage of deaths that took place in the marketplace. They went ahead with the Protectron idea, but for some reason the Protectrons used lethal force against the shoplifters. But not just the shoplifters. The Protectrons killed five shoplifters, one bystander, and even a Fallon's cashier. They disabled the Protectrons, which is why we find them in their charging bays when we arrive, and they canceled further merchant meetings to avoid more media scrutiny. Ooh, it was a sad time for merchants in Faneuil Hall just before the bombs dropped. But like the Founding Fathers before them, the people of Boston and the Fallout universe used Faneuil Hall as a meeting place. We find a collection of some of the meeting notes that took place just before the bombs dropped. Here we see more evidence about the Society's focus on preserving the cultural importance of Faneuil Hall at the expense of the merchants and their security. Incidentally, there's a note here that says that the Society voted to file a suit against the Old Corner Bookstore due to violating the Historic Preservation Charter. Now, the Old Corner Bookstore is not here in Faneuil Hall, but it is nearby. This may actually be a veiled reference to our own world. In the Fallout universe, the Old Corner Bookstore is still a bookstore, but in our world, the original building that the Old Corner Bookstore was in is now a Chipotle. If there was ever a way to violate the cultural significance of a historic landmark, turning it into a Chipotle has got to rank right up there. The meeting notes continue. We learned that the Protectrons were finally okayed by the mayor of the town, who had them installed despite 
the society's objections. And we learned that there were problems with the hall's roof. A contractor had just begun work on repairing the hall the very week the bombs dropped. On a table in this room, we find the cashier's key. This opens up the locked door to the cashier's room in the rear of the building. Here we find a bunch of cash registers to loot and pre-war money laying out, and also a wall safe with ammunition and cash. Heading upstairs, we find ourselves in a stairway. The stairs continue up, but they are broken. But as soon as we get up here, the super mutants start shooting at us from the room beyond the broken doors. This forces us to go into the town meeting hall to get rid of the super mutants before we can continue exploring. They race us from the floor and shoot at us from the second floor gallery. Once done, we can go back to the stairway and explore the rooms on this level. In one room covered in old paintings, we find a super mutant next to some display cases. This is one of the rooms that attaches to the elevator. We can hop on down and lift up the hatch, but there's really nothing there. We can look up to see that it connects to the floor above us. On the other side of the stairway are two bathrooms. Inside the men's restroom, we find a tension trigger on one of the bathroom stalls, but it's not protecting anything. Instead, we can go into the women's restroom, where we find a female skeleton sitting on a toilet next to a stash of caps. Now we can go on into the hall, and it must have been quite resplendent. We see huge paintings depicting early American history and noting the significance of this building. But the super mutants don't care. They've lit a fire in the middle of the hall, and we see many of the chairs are missing. That's because these mutants have taken all of the chairs and set them out by the statue of Samuel Adams outside and set them on fire. We see a big broken clock in the middle presented to the city by the children of Boston. There's a lot to loot here from duffel bags to ammo crates and a whole lot of meat bags where you can find ammunition, caps, and of course meat. You can rack up a bit of experience by cooking all of this at a cooking station. From the gallery, we can go out the back door to arrive on the second floor of the stairway. Inside one room, we find the final elevator door and an ammo crate and that's about it. Going around to the other side, we find one larger room with a duffel bag inside and other minor loot. And then heading out to climb up to the top of the building, we have to disarm a handmade tripwire connected to a fragmentation bouquet from the ceiling. Up the stairs to the final floor, we come face to face to a super mutant brute and his hound. I hear something! Please go. You're gonna pay for that! It's here that we find Live and Love, fabulous first issue, lifelong best friends. Companions permanently gain plus 10 to health. After looting the room and the end of dungeon chest, we can climb a ladder to the roof of Faneuil Hall. As soon as we pass through the door, we see the grasshopper. The roof construction we read about in the manager's terminal is a great pretext for all of the scaffolding, which makes it easy for us to navigate the rooftops. And it's here that we find the body of Marty Bullfinch. If you have Valentine with you, he'll bid Marty farewell. Hmm. Guess Marty never quite made it. Don't worry, pal. We'll close this one out for you. At last, we can walk up to the broken dome that once housed the bell in the bell tower and take the gilded grasshopper wither vein. Inside the grasshopper, we find a rolled up note called Food for the Grasshopper. Shem Drown made it May 25th, 1742. To my brethren and fellow grasshoppers, fell in the year 1753, 1755, November 13th, early in the morning, by a great earthquake by my old master above. Again, like to have met with utter ruin by fire, by hopping timely from my public station, came to the broken bones, and much bruised, cured, and fixed. Old master's son, Thomas Drown, June 28th, 1768, and though I will promise to discharge my office, yet I shall vary as the wind. On the banks of the Charles, where forever rests Master Shem, there one can find a life's worth. After reading the note, we get a new quest objective to find Shem Drown's grave. But this note is a little perplexing. What does it all mean? Well, the earthquake in the note refers to the real-world earthquake of 1755. During that earthquake, 
the grasshopper weather vane fell from the building and crashed to the ground. Shem Drown, the original coppersmith who made the grasshopper, was still around, and he and his son Thomas repaired the grasshopper and remounted it. Many years later, in 1768, Shem Drown's son Thomas placed a note inside the grasshopper named Food for the Grasshopper, exactly like the one we find in the game. Thomas refers to his father as the Old Master. But in real life, Thomas ends the note with the words, Yet I shall vary as the wind. But in the game, Bethesda added the words, On the banks of the Charles, where forever rests Master Shem, there one can find a life's worth. So the note in the grasshopper does not accurately depict the real one in the real weather vane. Following the map marker, we eventually come to a graveyard. Now we know from history that the real Shem Drown was buried in Copps Hill Burying Ground on the north end of Boston. Many famous people from early Boston history were buried in the cemetery, including Prince Hall, the founder of Black Freemasonry, and Robert Newman, who placed the signal lanterns in the Old North Church for Paul Revere's midnight ride to Lexington and Concord. Even though it's an unmarked location, this must mean that the very graveyard where we now stand is the very same Copps Hill burial ground. After killing the ghouls in this cemetery, we find Shem Drown's grave. After a little bit of digging, we unveil a coffin wherein we find the skeleton of Shem Drown. Inside, we find a note. Fear not, though devil's iron makes this blade, only he who wields can make it wicked. Drown. On the skeleton is Shem Drown's sword, a revolutionary sword that adds radiation damage. It's got an interesting green color to it. It's interesting that he says, though devil's iron makes this blade. What does he mean by that? We don't really know. There are a couple of possibilities. Maybe the sword was made from a meteorite. Although since it does give radiation damage, maybe it's made from an iron imbued with uranium or some sort of radioactive metal. Perhaps the metal was harming Shem Drown as he made the sword, which is why he refers to it as Devil's Iron. Inside the coffin, we find a bunch of bars of silver, copper, and one bar of gold. This is, of course, a reference to Shem Drown's real-life profession, a metalsmith. So, Shem Drown had himself buried with all his treasure. Guess some people just can't let go. Interestingly, if you take a look at the gravestone, we see that Shem Drown's name isn't on it. Instead, it's the exact same name that I found on the gravestones in Salem when I did my video on Salem, M. Thomas Webb. But in this case, the text is printed backwards on the gravestone. I guess Bethesda never expected us to read the text on these gravestones. Part of this quest comes right from history, and some of it is pure fantasy. There was a real Shem Drown, he was a metal worker in Boston, he made the Gilded Grasshopper, and his son put the note inside of it. But to turn it into a quest, Bethesda added the line about the grave in the note, and invented a sword made from radioactive metal that Shem Drown must have made, but only in the Fallout universe. This was a whole lot of fun, and I really enjoyed that we got to take Nick with us on yet another mission. That was my favorite thing about Far Harbor. We got to actually work with Nick on a detective case, and the case of the Gilded Grasshopper is one of too few detective cases that we can actually work with Nick on in the game. What are your thoughts on Faneuil Hall and Shem Drown and his sword? Did you go with Nick to find the Gilded Grasshopper, or did you stumble upon it by yourself? on accident? Let me know in the comments section below. I read all of your comments and I use them as inspiration for my future videos. What video would you like to see next? I just finished a big series on Good Neighbor. I have a huge list of new content to make for Fallout 4, but I'd love to hear what you'd like to see next. If you're interested in some Oxhorn gear, check out my shirt shop. Teespring and I have put together some fun Oxhorn and Fallout 4 themed shirts, and you can find a link to my shop in the description below. And if you like what I do and you want to support me in a more personal way, consider becoming one of my patrons on Patreon. Patreon subscribers get access to a private channel on my Discord server, as well as a bunch of other cool Oxhorn perks. But more than anything, ladies and gents, I'm just so glad you're here watching this video with me today. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you tomorrow morning, bright and early, with a brand new video.